Thank you for uh, taking the time to watch my presentation, uh, which is titled uh, Creating Ghosts from Across the Pacific. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Connell. I'm a creative director and art director at uh, Sucker Punch and is art director on um, Ghost of Tsushima. I have an art and background, art and computer science background, um, roughly 17 years experience um, doing what I do. Um, I come from a background of lighting, um, shaders, <laughs> lighting and color and cinematography. Um, and um, and yeah, and if you want to reach me, uh, you can reach me at uh, my Twitter here at, uh, at Art Envelope. I work at Sucker Punch Productions. Sucker Punch Productions has been around for... Um, for uh, coming on, I think about 25 years, and they've made some super cool action games. I've been I've been there for about 11 years. Um, was a big fan of Sly Cooper and a super big fan of Infamous. And I came um, around the time that Infamous 2 was being created. And uh, eventually we went on to make a game called Infamous Second Son, which was made in uh, Seattle. And that's actually really uh, about where we're located. We're located across the water from Lake, Wa Lake Washington and uh, Bellevue. And which is just super close to Seattle, for those who don't know. And so that was kind of our backyard, you know, creating this open world action game uh, with a guy who has superhero powers. And, uh, you know, that power of doing right by the details, not all the details, but the details to sort of capture what Seattle could feel like was a great uh, learning uh, for us because our um, next game was about bringing the authenticity of an open world environment to a place that is pretty far away from us. Um, and we had to, to really utilize some of our skill sets, but um, really frankly, we uh, had to develop a whole lot of new skill sets in order to make this uh, work. This is very, um, very different from um, Seattle. So, and it was also far back in time. And I'm of course I'm talking about um, Ghost of Tsushima. Now, you know, this time we're not creating Seattle, we're creating um, or representing a culture that we do not know uh, it's not familiar. It's not local by any stretch of imagination. We are not inherently experts. And it's certainly not anywhere close to 1274. In fact, it's so long ago that it's hard to actually dig up history about it. You know, Ghost of Tsushima is, a, is an open world um, uh, action samurai game inspired by real events in history. The Mongols invaded in 1274. And to make this game, we really had to partner with people across the Pacific to um, make a game that respects the genre, and the culture. We effectively had to change the way we make games and had a lot to learn along the way. Now, everything that I'm going to talk about today is super important, but it probably could come off at some point. And it sounds like, you know, maybe each one of these topics is just too laborious. And you may ask yourself, was, why is this actually important? You know, um, that I'm going to talk a lot about how much time it takes to sort of solve some of these problems. And you might think, well, that's a huge tax on making fast decisions. And, you know, we all want to fail fast. It's video games. It's creative endeavors. Um, that's true. Um, but, you know, time, time, it does take time to sort out some of these issues. Um, and, you know, simple things may seem more complex. But to us, solving these issues and uh, developing these relationships with our consultants and stuff was sort of the cost of entry. So why is this important? You know, it's important because we felt like we had a duty to treat this with care, to fulfill the expectations of the genre and to do so with thoughtfulness, because that was our goal. We wanted to create something that people who like this genre of movies or books or other games that could be excited about it. But it was uh, viewed as something that was done with thoughtfulness. So to this day, Ghost of Tsushima has won some various awards, including some specific accolades by Japanese gamers and press. Um, Famitsu 40 for, out of 40 was super humbling for us. And recently, Nate and I got and extended to the rest of the studio, uh, uh, awarded uh, honorary tourism ambassadors to Tsushima, which is just like the coolest thing that's ever happened in my life. But it did take a lot of work to get here. So let me share a little bit about our journey and making this game from across the Pacific. This talk is broken up into four sections. I'm going to talk about how Ghost came about, sort of uh, hinging on almost didn't come about because of a single fear, uh, sort of our transition into having to take the position of learning. We're directors and leaders, and that's how we've made games. We built upon, uh, you know, we make decisions built upon uh, our uh, expertise. But this time we're going to have to sit down and, and listen to somebody else tell us what they think is, is right for us. And uh, this particular game, and that's 
that's a different frame of mind. Um, as well as um, the complications of once you do become that student and you do hire a consultant, you're going to get feedback about history and culture. And sometimes that goes in conflict with the game you're creating. And you gotta you gotta sort that out. And um, and I'm gonna share with you uh, some of our insight there. And lastly, it's kind of a form of its own. Uh, it's like entertainment consultant. Uh, is what inspirations do you have, and what inspirations uh, specifically we had for Ghost? So let's start off with talking about the beginning. So it was August 2014. We had just created Infamous First Light, and. Uh, you know, it took us took us a little bit of time to figure out what we we're going to do next. We knew we had the opportunity to create a new IP, and we had some ideas. And these ideas, you know, we, I'd said we had something like 150 people at the studio at Sucker Punch. These ideas um, that we had were very broad. They were cool ideas, but they were very broad. And you take every single person in the studio, and they they form their own slightly different variation of what that idea could be. And it was just really hard to, to bring it to a super sharp, simple idea. And that's what we needed. We needed an idea for our next game that was, we didn't want everybody to be on the exact same page because that's what, you know, having variation and differing opinion is what makes great games. But we needed something that was sharper and more simple and really powerful and that our 150 people weren't going off wildly in different directions. And what we decided is that we needed another strong player fantasy to fulfill and frankly, we've done this before, right? Second Son, or excuse me, Infamous, Infamous in general is a superhero player fantasy, or the Sly series is about being a thief. We have expertise here, and this was this was something that we've done a great job with in the past, so we knew we wanted to do that again. What's the super clear player fantasy we wanted to fulfill? So we talked about being a medieval knight and what that might look like, a medieval knight simulator or something like that. Or, you know, hey, we could do a modern thief game. And we have some expertise in the past. Some of those people are still at the studio. Hey, could we do this? And then we had the beauty, the samurai, the, the game that we ended up making. But we actually crossed this one out really fast. Um, uh, Nate and I, um, we were like, we're, we're totally uh, culturally inexperienced here. I'm not sure if we know how we can make this game. Um, we don't have uh, cultural experts. We don't have experience hiring that that many to make a game as big and as epic as we'd like to. We sort of had this moment of fear. So we were cursed down night and thief for about two more weeks. I don't remember how long it was exactly. And then we came back and we're like, you know what? We love samurai stories. We're huge fans of samurai cinema, Kurosawa, um, or, um, you know, I know Nate's a big fan of uh, graphic novels like Lone Wolf and Cub or Usagi Ujimbo. We're so inspired by this that we felt like we should at least give it a shot. Because at this point in a project, if you don't have enough ambition and passion to carry you through now, you're not going to for the next four or five years. I mean, these games would take so long to make. So Samurai it was. We decided we were going to try it. And we gave it some art and we started working on it. And we had, um, um, we had, we had, we had ourselves going in a direction, but we still had that fear in the back of our minds. How are we going to do this thoughtfully? We had this very real cultural journey that was in front of us that we needed to understand and figure out how were we going to accomplish it. And the interesting thing is that very quickly we realized, well, we do have some pretty big advantages. For example, we had people within our organization that we had worked with for a long time that were Japanese, that were big fans of Sucker Punch, that we could talk to and give them the pitch and tell them what we were planning on doing and you know just, just get their feedback. And Shuhei Yoshida-san was so excited about the game and gave us some feedback about how we might be able to create it that it gave us ambition that we might be able to pull this off. And frankly, for us to be successful here, we didn't know how, how, how much we were going to be doing this, but we did know that there were some things we were going to have to change in the way we make games. First of all, every time you make a game, somebody's going to get hired. Uh, it's animator, or a graphics engineer, producers. This time, there was this whole new subset of team members that we were going to have to hire that we had never experienced working with in the past. Um, people that, even at that point when we started, you know, we knew we had, uh, for example, religion. We needed somebody to help us with, with Japanese religion because we were totally inexperienced here. But as time went on, that team, that list just grew and grew and grew. But we knew that we we're going to have to kind of reshape our minds a little bit about what type of team members we're going to need in order to pull this off. And we're going to have to do research. Now, every game, especially these big games like this, you know, there's there's lots of research that goes in. Like, 
shader research, you know, for example, but not to the level of like historical, religious, you know, cultural, deep cultural research and consultants guiding you. It's just something that we've just totally never done before. And these two were going to catapult us into um, being absorbed with information. We're going to constantly be giving information. And that really catapulted us into the second section I want to talk about. So we had ghosts. We, uh, our fears of creating it were defeated by our excitement and some of our partners and like, you know, uh, Shu being so supportive so early gave us enthusiasm to move forward. But now we have, we are put into a position where we no longer can just sit there and be directors about literally everything. We, we had to sit down a little bit and sort of frankly buckle up and, 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 and take in information and realize that we're not going to be driving literally everything. That's, that's good. And, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So we sort of had to become the, uh, become students and becoming a student is, is, um, is got a couple, got a couple things in common, right? Like got to show up, got to have an urge to listen, got to have a uh, yearning to learn, probably going to accept the fact that you don't know everything. Certainly about checking assumptions. If you, <laughs> I saw uh, a samurai movie one time, um, that's great. It might have some great information in there, but it's great to sort of check those assumptions with some uh, consultants. They might be like, yeah, but it doesn't work the way you think it might. And, and, and that was really good for us. And frankly, the most important one uh, around the topic of being a student is, is really getting into research and I'm and especially field research, if you can. And for us, it was really beneficial because that's the really exciting one. We actually got to go on a trip to Tsushima and Japan and do real research. And that's that's just so much deeper than your typical cursory kind of um, well, Google's not cursory anymore. You can learn anything on Google. But um, this was just so powerful for us that it helped uh, augment the work that we're already doing from a research angle. I can, we were, uh, photos that we we're looking at and documents we we're reading online, actually getting to go to the place. And I took all these pictures I'm about to show you. I kind of went there thinking, you know, you know, this is gonna be one thing, but it really provided, proved to be sort of beneficial in ways that I I had no idea that I would walk away from uh, that trip feeling the way I did. I really went into that trip thinking, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to go on this epic trip to Japan. You know, we're going to gain a ton of knowledge of what it is that we were building and how to create it effectively. And this did become true, right? You know, Tsushima and greater Japan and all this, you know, on our entire trip, this did become true. We, 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 we learned about... You know, what did the buildings look like? How tall were they? What materials were they made out of? You know, those cool katanas and nodachis and, and odachis? Like, how do, how, how do you create a sword? What types of foliage should we use in certain climates of Japan? Thousands of photos, hundreds of pages of note, two trips to Japan with 10 plus members of our sort of senior leads and directors. We brought back an enormous library of photos, drone footage, you know, you name it to reference from. It was, it was awesome. But to me, the real beauty was so, so much more important than that. It was building new relationships with people that were going to guide us, passionately guide us and desperately guide us. Uh, one, they had so much energy for, for helping us. And we were so inexperienced here, like just learning the types of questions we needed to ask and you know, um, and, and how to document it and how to, uh, uh, categorize our notes. Like, it's just, there's just so much to take in, but the human connection with some of these people, like, uh, the guy in the black shirt here, his name is Jonah, Jonah Nagai. And he worked for Sony Japan, helped organize our first trip. I was on this trip with him and he was so invested in answering any question we had, you know, introducing us to food. He took us to the shrine, which is where one of the warriors that uh, fought at this actual real invasion he fought and died here on this beach. And there was a shrine here commemorating this uh, fight. Took us there, took us to the beach where the invasion actually happened. It's uh, called Komodohama Beach. Honestly, I thought it was just going to be those photos and sort of just like what we're making. And what became true was I was so invested from an emotionally perspective, from an emotional point of view. Like I came back home thinking, I really want to do right by all the people that helped us and the new colleagues that I have and the new friends that I had. I really wanted to 
uh, do right by uh, the locations that I saw. And I think our entire team felt that way. And so you have this like personal investment that's far bigger than just creating a piece of entertainment. And it really helps drive your ambition and your passion and your patience to, to tackle some of these very challenging problems ahead. So that personal investment is very real. When you take on a project like this, you're also going to learn a lot about various um, uh, you know, things like here's a katana or a Natachi. A Tachi, I can't remember which exactly what this one this one is, but you learn a lot about how a sword is created. And this right here is called a suba. And suba is just this handguard. And that's what I kind of went into this uh, trip thinking it was. And then I went to a sword museum and I realized, and this sword museum was just insane. They make swords, they have old decorative swords here. And you realize this suba is not just a handguard. It is a handguard. It's a lot more than that. It is icons of just artistry and mastery, just beautiful pieces of Japanese artwork that I just kind of thought was a cool looking handguard. And you realize that sometimes it's connected to family, sometimes it's connected to the stories. There's, there's so much art and craft that goes into a single sword. And that even that little piece of inspiration, that little nugget of knowledge drives so, come, you come back home and months later and it drives so much energy to create our own weapons and our own swords and getting those details, not just to be cool, but if we had a character that was, her name was Masako, who was going after the, the people that killed her grand, her grandbabies, she's a hunter. And so going after, you know, when we have to create this piece of artwork, it's not just a generic piece of cool art. It's connected to who she is as a character in an artfully poetic way, deepening her story or deepening our main hero story, which is Jin Sakai, the Sakai storm, you know, it's deeply connected to him and his pushing out the Mongol invasions, which, you know, they say that a windstorm came and pushed them, pushed the Mongols off the island. And that's, that's like us being inspired by the artistry and the craftsmanship, even in this single suba. And so that research trip did give us a lot of photos. It did give us a lot of great, um, uh, you know, uh, reference guide, but the personal investment to do a great job coming back home and saying, man, J Jonah was a great guy. I wanted to write by him. Um, how can, you know, and feeling that you're now you're part of a team and that inspiration carried us through uh, so many, so many hard times. And I can't recommend a trip like that enough. We did have to grow our team. Uh, we grew our team quite a bit. This isn't all of them, but these are the types of positions that we sort of grew in terms of the consultants we bring on. We had a number of people from Sony Japan that um, actually helped us from the very beginning. Um, Yuhei Katami actually ended up moving over to the U.S. and at some point, and he actually worked on our project full-time for a number of years. Uh, he's a great producer, a great consultant. He's he's just incredible. And so we, we've surrounded ourselves with some internal folks. And then we actually surrounded ourselves with some, you know, language consultants, some Mongolian language consultants. We had one person very early on to just help us understand religion, the difference between Shintoism or Shinto and Buddhism or a temple and a shrine. It was very confusing. And it's even more confusing for 1274, predating the Meiji Restoration. Uh, it even gets more complex. And so having someone that was just an expert in this very complicated uh, area was so helpful. Obviously, our game's about combat. There's a ton of combat consultants that we had, and all of them are just exquisite and just amazing and just so, so helpful. And we even had some people that weren't necessarily brought on to be consultant guides, like Shigeru Omobayashi was our composer, one of our two composers. Uh, he's Japanese, and um, he would see our game, and he would give us feedback. And of course, it was just like so great to get feedback from our Japanese composer, and to hear his voice and to just understand what he thought we were making and what we could do to, to, to make it better. So even though he's making the music and I couldn't wait to hear the music, I was also excited that he was invested enough to say, hey, you know, maybe these plants could be different. And that was, that was excellent. So we've equipped ourselves with new colleagues to guide us. And we've sort of uh, gotten into this position of learning, or really sitting back and taking uh, taking a seat, taking a position of learning from these guides. So now we have these historical guides, and we have these consultants, cultural consultants surrounding us. But we still had to make a game, and sometimes there's this conflict. You know, the you know something the guide says is very different than what you need the game to be, and you have to resolve this conflict. And this is where. All I can tell you right up front is that the majority of time it, it can take to get these problems right because it's about balancing 
um, you know, uh, you know, uh, how can, how can the game be an incredibly fun game, but also a poetic and artful and thoughtful experience. And that takes time and it takes time getting to know your consultants. It takes time getting to know your game. And that's a, that's a huge part of what we, what we do. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our examples and some of our goals with what we were doing. So at the very top, it's important to really highlight what we were building. Now, we are not, and we never wanted to be, a sort of a Sushma one-for-one, rock-for-rock, stone-for-stone, you know, uh, building-for-building simulator. First of all, the game, is, it, it takes place in 1274. It's just so long ago, it's hard to even understand exactly where things were. But furthermore, that's not our team size. It's not our goal. It's, it's actually, we, our goal is to really just get enough of those details right to transport you in an artistic and respectful way. If the details are really important, we're going to get them right. We're not going to mess those up. And we, we surround ourselves with people to get it right. But outside of that, we want you to feel transported and it, make it feel memorable for you. And actually, this is just for its worth. This is exactly what we did with Second Son. We made the game in Seattle. But you know, Pioneer Square doesn't look anything like our Pioneer Square. It has similar brick types and material types. The Space Needle is in the game, but it's not exactly in the right spot. And, you know, we were, um, th there are two bridges, but they're sort of nowhere near the same type of bridges that we have here. It's about the impressionistic view of something, a blurry eyed view showcasing sort of the feeling of a place, you know, of people's perception that Seattle is rainy and, and wet. It is. Then, then we should deliver some version of that. And maybe we push it and we may ex be expressive. So we're trying to create a system that can be expressive and artful and entertaining, but culturally thoughtful as well. Now, if it's not about getting every single detail right, that's great. You might think that saves you some time, but I'll tell you, it, I don't know if it does because literally as soon as you invite the con you know your consultants to sort of kind of partake in giving feedback on every axis of their game you realize very quickly that every department is going to be affected by this. So you have to plan for the time. So just to run through a couple of things that you may not consider. I've heard all of these on our game. And it, uh, there's an instrument in the game that's playing. You know, was that instrument really around in 1274 or you know, uh, those outfits, they don't really look like the history reference that I saw or that family crest. It's, it's real and it's a modern crest and it belongs to some modern family. This could, you know, be sort of um, looked at poorly. You know, the story moment is anachronistic or these, the architectural style is off or the modern, the dialect is too modern. It's not about, I could go on and on, it's not about getting all of these right because we don't have the time. We could work on this for 10 years and you could get some of these wrong. Just creating them is tough. But what, which ones are important? That's the ones you want to work with your guides on. Which ones are the ones that we must get right? And which ones are going to be transportative? And you want, and, 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 uh, you want to get those right because in the end, details really do matter. Getting details right is so important. And I'll tell you right now, I didn't really know what a Tory gate was before I, I took on this project. I kind of knew, but I, you know, taking on this project, you learn very quickly what it is. But you know, in our, you know, in our team, we started first putting the gates in the in the in the world, and you Google a Tory gate, and you're going to get something like this pretty quickly. You're going to see something modern. And it's a little bit flashy. It's it's larger. It's it's not of humble origins. It's of you know pretty pretty big origins. And you work with your consultants pretty early and you realize this, this is not really representing a authentic view of old Japan. This feels very new and modern. And you get guidance that like maybe you should head back into a more natural feeling where you feel like they're made out of natural pieces of wood. They're humbler in size to represent the smaller community that, um, you know, Tsushima, uh, uh, you know, had. And there's a lot of amazing shrines in, 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 on, on Tsushima, but we, we were representing it a little bit poorly at first in our first kind of look into it. So it's about going one level deeper, deeper on those details to make sure that you get them right. And so thanks, thanks to our guides for helping out with those details. And there's a lot more, especially around religion that I could go into, but I'm going to hit um, a couple other topics like naming. Now naming a hero for a new IP that nobody's heard this name before. Has, it's so hard. You want it to be short and sweet and has personality and easy to say, you know, um, regardless of what you're making, you want these memorable names and, uh, you know, we had this complication here that, you know, was brought up. It's like, oh, well, 
are we going to name him in, in the English version? Are we going to name him like it would be in Japan where you'd have the family name and then the given name? Or are we going to do a European style or, you know, how my name is like Jin Sakai, Jason Connell. And we actually had to talk about this because all of your scripts will have to be written this way. You know, it's, it's a pretty big change. if You're going to do it in English. We had to talk about it. You had to create time to have this discussion, which we've never had this problem before. Now, this problem ended up solving itself because we decided to make a Japanese localization track ship with every single copy, and you can select it from the very first uh, menu in the game. We realized that this is going to solve itself. We're just going to let people play the way they want to play. But that time, it, we did consider the options early on. We had to discuss this. Our consultants brought it up. I think uh, Ryuhei brought it up himself. And there are other issues that we had with names. Like we had a character whose name shipped with Yuna, but her name was Yone for a very long time. And that name actually came from one of our Japanese uh, partners very early. Now, her character over time started morphing into a character that um, had modern ideals and sort of uh, that name Yone sort of started clashing with sort of her character type over time. And we started getting feedback from our um, consultants and our kind of partners that her name didn't really fit with who her, who she's becoming. And man, we had already done written some stuff. We had been working on this name for a long time. And to us, Yone and Yuna sound so similar. I, we don't know. And so we're completely blind to this. And so you have to trust in the people that you're getting guidance from. And so for this particular example, even though we didn't understand and maybe we were even perplexed, you have to ask them and you have to trust. And when they, when somebody says, oh, it, the, the character doesn't feel like it matches the name, it's really kind of pulls you out of the experience for them. It, the name felt very old. It was an old feeling name and this character was very modern in their ideals. That's bad to us. That's, I don't want that for any of our characters. So if we ended, you know, even though we had production sort of things to sort, sort out, we ended up changing the character's name. Now, again, I could continue going on and on and on with a ton of examples. In fact, probably could give a two-hour presentation about all of these types of examples. But that's not the point. The point is, this stuff, it takes time. It takes time to sort them out. It takes time to realize which consultants are the, are the, are, are the right people to handle different types of ta tackle different types of problems. It takes time to hire consultants. The whole process takes time. And even, even uh, with us being pretty committed to it, it still, uh, it still takes a lot of time. So I think that's one of my most important points that I wanted to convey in this is that even though our team treated this very, very, very uh, seriously, it still just took a lot of time. Um, so I do think there's some, 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 some things I can share, though, that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. So here were a few ways that we, um, you know, we, when we get a piece of feedback that we could potentially see the feedback be broken up into different types of answers. Um, so we'd get a piece of feedback and talking to our consultant, they would say, oh, you know what? This is an okay thing to experiment in. So we'd be good to go and we would try some experimentation. We'd get some feedback that's just like a hard no. This is super, you know, um, you need to avoid this. Uh, this is, you know, it's not what you think it is. And we just full stop. We just listen. Sometimes there's game needs and, um, and, and the game has to function a certain way. There's, it's got to be fun. We want the, you know, the progression to work a certain way. And that doesn't mean we don't listen to our consultants at all. We just kind of keep going back saying, okay, what if we try this? Or what if we try that? And, and you know, typically we can find something that works, that feels uh, comfortable, and we can both uh, have our cake and eat it too. And then sometimes, it's my favorite, you can have feedback that inspires design and inspire big design changes. Now, I'm going to give you a couple examples. We, at one point in the script, had seppuku, which is this act of sort of killing oneself. And... Um, Super clear feedback very early on that that was something we should avoid. It's out of time period. It felt like we were shoving it in because it's a trope. We thought it was very interesting. We certainly didn't want any of that. So we actually rewrote that out, um, and and we've never looked back. It was the right decision, and we're really glad that we removed it. Um, we get feedback about architecture in our game. So we did have a lot of architecture that was Kamakura period inspired. And if you know, that's actually the time period that these buildings were built, and there was a certain way they looked. But at, at some point, we started experimenting with other types of uh, building structures, and we got some feedback that, why are we doing this? And we would talk to them, and what we learned is that, you know what? It's actually great if you do a good job with establishing Kamakura as the base, and then you're sort of exploring in architectural styles to try to create unique feeling across the island or little pockets of you know, um, you know, um, memorable locations, and it was okay to experiment, and that was, that was good for us to hear. Same thing with outfits, by the way. 
sometimes the game has needs. And our game specifically, we wanted no mini map. We wanted no compass. We didn't want, we wanted to be able to look around the island and see what you want to do next. But Tsushima is like hills everywhere and super dense forests. We have a horse. You got to ride a horse. You got to fight. You can't be on steep inclines. So we actually had to flatten some areas out. We still have lots of hills. We had to flatten some areas out. We had to deforest a little bit so that we could get that, um, you know, those flat areas where you could see where you're going next. And we had to work with our consultants about what the right feeling was. And we eventually uh, got there in a, in a great way. But that was a lot of where the game had needs. And lastly, we used to have hunting in the game because I think it's very common and, you know, have bow, see animal, must kill. And there's this like feature that's hunting in games that is great for a lot of games. And we didn't particularly want to go deep on it. But moreover, we got feedback that hunting, you know, deer was just it's so, it's so strange because hunting mindlessly didn't really fit into the culture of Japan. You know, it was sort of like they had a lot of huge respect for animals, especially these deer. So, okay, we had to reevaluate this. At the same time, we were discussing ways in which we could, you know, maybe, um, uh, make Jin fall in love with the island? How can we inspire him to really feel like he's being guided by the island more? And this changed to the way that we treated animals, sort of, next thing you know, the wind came up, and then we had birds. We de uh, uh killing deer, and this sort of in, in kind of gave us a whole new look at some of uh, the way we treat animals in the game. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some of the takeaways uh, for some of the um, areas where our consultants and our guides came into sort of uh, almost like conflict with some of our game goals and how we sort of maybe overcame some of those and some of the takeaways. Well, first of all, 1274 was so long ago that there were a numerous amount of historical discrepancies and variation in what we were um, kind of uh, researching. It was just it was just kind of all over the place. Um, we had to surround ourselves with enough guides that would give us good feedback and we would have to take the best approximate guess to sort of solve some of of our historical based issues you know we surround ourselves with the facts and try to do the best we could each example as given by the previous section with the four quadrants each example completely different challenges i mean they're different teams they're different challenges they're different levels of passion and, and, and um, sometimes uh, sometimes it's even technical hurdles like it's 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 uh, it's could underline and bold this but it's just so different for each um, uh, piece of feedback that you might get now one thing that we did was really helpful is we had uh, Rihei Katami he was sort of our point person he was at the nexus of almost every single piece of um, feedback that we tried to address. In fact, actually, he became so close to um, some of the team members. I know for me in particular, I utilized my, 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 actually my relationship with Irihei grew so much throughout the part of this project because I would talk to him so much and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think about that? You know, anytime Nate and I or one of their leads had an idea about, doesn't matter if it's an animation thing, you know, how the character holds a sword or a story thing or an architectural bit. I, we would call him and say, hey, what do you think about blah? And if he didn't know, then he would kind of um, go down the list of he would know who to talk to and would either point us in the right direction or he would take on the problem himself. He was so invested in having that single point of contact allowed us to be very proactive in um, our endeavors to sort these problems out if, you know, and point at them as in the ideation phase, not wait till they're already through production. And it was also made it really great to, uh, it was, you know, I think this is a great goal. Um, luckily for us, it never turned into an us versus them or, you know, game versus history in a real, you know, um, conflict, like negative sense. It was very collaborative and it was that way because it felt like we had, you know, people like you helping us that were just part of the game team. Like we were just trying to create a great game together. And that collaboration is key because we are a team. And I can't say this enough too, that, it really isn't about getting all the details perfectly fit and right. And, and even our consultants would guide us here. It's, it's about the very specific ones are very important, but it's ener enough to earn that belief and that trust and that respect. And, um, and that's, and that, and, and then the rest of it's how do you create the great piece of poetic entertainment that we were hoping that we would create? 
And that sort of goes on to talk a little bit about the next section. You know, um, that's a little bit about how we dealt with some of that feedback and how entertainment and sort of our um, guidance along the way could sometimes collide. Um, and hopefully that's helpful to you. But, you know, this next section is really, you know, I want to talk about what inspired Ghost and how, frankly, this is the you know, the other pieces of entertainment ended up being sort of their own uh, consultants in a way. You know, I want to talk about our, frankly, our inspirations. We talk a lot about various types of other consultants that we had that were, you know, very specialized that we brought in to help create the game. But one and very important strategy is that we studied, you know, the works of all of these great creators that came before our game was even an idea or even sometimes before we were around. You know, how how have Japanese artists and you know, filmmakers and Japanese game developers depicted Japan in the past or maybe Japan-like places, if, even if that's a made-up place. So our goal was to create a piece, you know, an entertainment piece, a piece of uh, a work of art and a, a game that sits right next to the artistry that we were, frankly, inspired by so much growing up. You know, frankly, we had decades of entertainment you know, consumption that have been ingrained into who we are and so we really believe that looking at some of these neighbors, some of our most influential pieces of work, could really help guide us. So I'm going to show you some of the inspirations that we had and ones that we held on to really tightly, even though it might have taken some time for, you know, for a while for us to really kind of um, see the benefits uh, come, come out. So we did set out with a few very distinct visual inspirations in mind, famous, simplified illustrators uh, from Japan like Hasui Kawase, featured really low detail style uh, block print artwork, bold and high contrast, but yet really impactful. You don't really see the rocks and the sand in these illustrations, but what you do see is the memorable shapes, the bold colors. It's it's very curated. And there's a lot of overlap with this simplified look and feel to this wonderful game called Breath of the Wild that showcases really great, dis, you know, kind of restrained and disciplined use of color and this like single beautiful species of grass. It's like lovely, like lovingly flowing through in the wind. It's beautiful. And there's this low noise feeling, this high color and saturation, and this great curated feeling to both of these. So the question was, could we take these types of inspirations and apply them to a more realistic samurai epic? That was the question. And this proved to be pretty hard. Uh, you know, we were frankly inherently Western game artists, and, and, and our goal was left her own kind of path was sort of heading towards the path of general general realism and so a common goal in games is to create these realistic spaces and uh, we just got done with second sun which was like had a little bit of that realism and that grittiness you know seattle's very different you know and uh, we kind of really headed this way pretty hard but it just felt like something wasn't right and wasn't really transportative it wasn't very memorable and at one point, it certainly didn't feel like some of those references that I just showed you. And at some point on uh, the project, you know, pretty fairly early, Shuhei, Shuhei Yoshida-san uh, gave us feedback that his, you know, memory, and this is great, his memory of Japan is that it was more green. He, he felt like it was missing that. And I just really like that. I thought that him saying his, his memory of Japan is that memory, you know, because memories are this like blurry thing where you don't see the every single tiny little detail, right? The, you know, the really the only things that 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 that, that resonate with you, or you're, something something will stand out. So, if we were going to create a fern forest, why would we go with the one on the left when we could honestly head more in this direction, where we create a fern forest that is single and species type? It's like all consuming. Like we want to leave you with the memory of a firm forest it's certainly more saturated more green and hopefully you you step away from that feeling like i visited the fern forest and i know where it is now and this had a lot of overlap with you know some of the references that i kind of mentioned earlier and certainly some of the paintings um the, or the illustrations that i, I mentioned as well from kawase so uh, this 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 was resonating with us and so we started taking the game in this direction and Boy, the, the the visuals exploded everywhere you went in the game. You, you could find this magnificent, beautiful, simplified, yet still gritty and kind of realistic. If you wanted to look at it, it had realistic features, but it was very simplified in like species. And that 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 was so important to us. It was this was so important to us. The noise, like the low noise, to try to match this like feeling, 
was so important to us that we created tools that our artists could use to find areas where there was too much noise in the game. If it was red, it was too noisy, and the artist could go in and do a pass to remove the amount of noise. And therefore, you could have this, you could very quickly and easily isolate that this rock texture here um, is a great rock texture, but it was very noisy, and you could go in and address it and simplify it down and let it sit down and sort of be uh, complementary to the art style that we were trying to go for instead of this uh, maybe um, adding more unnecessary realistic noise to the frame. And this was wonderful because we make an, we're making an open world game and this was our visual target. And where we landed was, you know, sort of in the cinematic um, stylized view of the game where there was minimal sort of species around around the world in terms of uh, foliage, but really, really, really uh, impactful and colorful. And at the textural level, we try to remove as much noise as possible. So you see the details that matter, um, which is sort of a theme for this entire topic or this entire uh, talk. And that manifested into multiple different types of biomes and an art style that sort of resonated with our fans in the end. But it's not all about, obviously, style and color. There's tons of other areas we were inspired by um, that changed the course of the game. Cinematography, I could go on and on about the types of cinematography that we were inspired by. I'll just say that we looked at a lot of old and new samurai movies, and we would look for patterns. And there were patterns that would pop up in a lot of these films, and one of them is which is like a centered framing with a human or a subject matter in the, in the very, very center, but it's very equal framing. And so we would look for these patterns, and then we would look for areas, whether it was in marketing or in um, the actual game cinematography, that we could utilize these patterns in our own ways because we know it would resonate with other fans that had watched these types of films, etc. Here's another one. Duels. If you've seen a samurai movie, there's this, and it's not about the duel, it's about the human tension that's so palpable between these two fierce warriors that are sort of standing behind this beautiful backdrop. Everything is just so amazing around them, and yet there's just this silent tension between these two people. And, you know, um, I didn't grow up necessarily watching samurai movies. In fact, I grew up watching what most of us would feel like in the, in the West or in the U.S. might be more um, uh, familiar to, which is Westerns. And they have the same thing because they are inspired by that. There's the same human tension is so palpable between two gunslingers, that is, is two people with a sword. And so we really felt like this was a great thing to capitalize on in terms of like put into our game, having that human tension because you've seen it in samurai movies and it's real and it's human, but it was also familiar. So what we did is we created a number of very specific duels in our game. And those duels are set against unique backdrops, really a beautiful display of environment art. There's this human narrative that usually is going on between you and the person that you're dueling. It's fairly serious. They're actually pretty tough too. That And there's a cinematic that happens before that builds the music. and It's really built around having tension before the fight. We would also create a feature later on called standoffs that would let you have systemic duels. So you could get into those more often, more frequent at your own discretion. But getting that tension was really key for us. We also were inspired by a number of books, uh, whether it's graphic novels for entertainment or if it was documentaries and books that would help us understand the history. You know, both of them do so much, but you know, the entertainment-based books, the graphic novels, the, the artistry in them, we could learn, I think what we learned was like human connection and variety of types of complex relationships, whether it was, you know, protecting a young you know, kid or, you know, something about betrayal, like a, somebody that might betray you. And certainly the books we learned about just the, how, how can we best depict the Mongol invasion um, and, and, and do right by what um, these history books could help us help us out with. So we looked at several books as well. Sometimes our research and, uh, and our kind of entertainment inspiration overlap, and our historical research and our kind of love for samurai cinema overlap. And in one particular way, it came out with just this like crazy, interesting, super new idea for the game. So we're big fans of um, you know, movies, Kurosawa movies, these movies that have you know, wind and movement um, in these uh, famous samurai classics. Um, but turns out, I mentioned a little bit before, but the wind also had a major part in the actual history of the events of 1274, the invasion. 
the belief is, is that this windstorm known as um, the divine wind sort of pushed the Mongols back to sea and protected Japan, not once, but actually twice. And that's kind of an incredible story. So incredible that we really um, decided that we should underline this. And it ended up becoming a mechanic in our game. It, uh, in, the, in our game, the wind, if you haven't played it, the wind actually guides you. There's no minimap or compass. You sort of kind of pick the wind's next target. And the game's particle effects in the wind would sort of blow in the direction you need to go next. So many reasons why this was a was a was a was a fun decision to come to, but it took that historical research and understanding. It took the years of samurai uh, movie watching that that we kind of uh, were so inspired by, and it took us sort of kind of coming up with a variety of ideas to get there. And so those overlapping themes really helped us come up with a really poetic and great feature that uh, um, really propelled the game in a lot of ways. So one of our greatest inspirations um, in the end came full circle. We're, we're, we're finishing up the game. And I mentioned that, you know, um, we were so inspired by Kurosawa. You know, we actually ended up having a mode in the game called Kurosawa mode. And it was introduced um, into the game after working with the Kurosawa estate, showing them our game sort of having a couple back and forth, answering some questions and really trying to faithfully show them what we're trying to create. And so much of our game is inspired by the art and the cinematography and the storytelling of a Kurosawa classic. We were just so honored to get to have this relationship and to have this feature and to have it named such. Because in the end, the fans of our collective, uh, you know, whether it's games or watching his, you know, those films, our collective biggest fans together could enjoy this, this crossover in this way in our game. And that was, that was, that was kind of like, um, the sort of towards the end of the project. And it was just this, uh, really rewarding moment for everyone, uh, here at the team. So just to kind of recap, we talked about how ghost got started with a simple player fantasy idea that almost wasn't samurai because we were scared of, this topic we were scared of how we were going to do this you know and i'm so glad we went back and, and and really chose samurai it was the right choice for us and i'm so glad that we kind of faced that that problem um and that challenge head on and and uh and and didn't let our fears sort of tear us away from our dreams uh we we talked a little bit about our uh, kind of journey into taking a little bit of a backseat, learning from people, the art of learning, if you will, and, and just being really proactive and developing, frankly, new relationships um, with a bunch of amazing people that help make our game great. And this is where the relationship is forged, right? Like the complex problem solving between game and authenticity and what happened in history and, you know, making entertainment and, you know, original story versus, you know, what happened, the true events. This is where the relationships of all of our consultants thrived and came alive. And and, um, and hopefully that section was helpful in, in sharing how we dealt with some of those, those uh, uh, subjects. And lastly, you know, way before we ever decided to make this game, we were fans of the genre. So, of course, we bring bring forward we bring forward our own kind of depiction of how it how we would hope it could be represented and how we hope it can be. Um, appreciated. And so those inspirations are really important. And sometimes those inspirations are guided by c consultants as well. Other consultants can give us feedback about its representation in Japan and how they might may or may not view it. But those inspirations are kind of what starts you off to begin with. So you have to have them throughout the entire game. You know, so to sum up, you know, creating massive pieces of entertainment, they take years to create five years to create six years to create games are they're so complicated they're minor miracles that they get finished at all sometimes you know and this is saying you're going through a lot of extra work and you might ask why go through all that extra work you know the years spent talking about these reference points the labor sometimes you're reworking you know names you know for us it's we really wanted to create a game that represents that you know, thoughtfully represents a culture that is not our own and and then that comes with a sense of responsibility and 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 if we wanted this to resonate with the wide audience um, in a way that all of those classic samurai films did for us or some of those games and books that i mentioned did for us then then we really need to pay attention to this 
and we need to take it seriously. So make no mistake, the responsibility is real and it's super heavy and it takes a lot of energy and patience. Uh, but like most things, um, you know, uh, requires strength in relationships with people around you, especially things like this. You know, that team that you develop along the way uh, can can be really transformative in the game that you can create. So we're honored, you know, that, that it played out the way it did. And, uh, and we did learn from many mishaps and lapses of judgment along the way, but we cannot really express how thankful we are that to you know, all of the consultants that did help us on this project, as well as all of our teammates in Japan, the localization team that recorded audio, people that recorded audio from us from Japan. Like it's just, the list goes on and on. So I'm just going to put a big loud thank you out to the world for um, anyone that ever helped give guidance and a feedback on our project and helped us understand more what we are creating so that we could make something that fits uh, the expectations of, of a great samurai game, a great piece of samurai media. So thank you all for helping us recreate uh, feudal Japan from across the Pacific. So thank you for uh, listening to my talk and um, sucker punch is hiring. If you're looking for a new adventure, cheers. <laughs>